everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is the daily show where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's Friday. It's been a very long week, but I also like to welcome back Sinead. We missed you. Thanks, yeah. guys. I really missed you guys, too. It's been pretty busy, but I'm happy to be back. Also, here is David Griffin. Happy to be here. Happy to talk about some movies. Sorry if uh, my voice is a little off. I have a little bit of a cold, I think. So. Have you been, have you been making out with John Campion? He's a handsome man. It's <laughs> difficult to resist those eyes, you know. It's tough. Rogan knows what I'm talking about. I don't know what you're talking about at all. <laughs> I, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Yikes. Also here is John Roca. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. I'm going to pick up the energy of this place. Let's do it. And I'm very happy that Sinead is back. That's my, that's my Friday girl. Aw, thanks. And also here is Perry Nemroff. I'm glad we saved me for last for when we got all the awkwardness out of our system. <laughs> this will be okay did, today. Did we? Did Probably we? not. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. All right, what do we get up first? Ryan Reynolds took to Twitter yesterday to announce that Atlanta actress Zazie Beetz has landed the role of Domino in Deadpool 2. Domino, a.k.a. Nina Thurman, has powers that manifest without her conscious control, affecting the situation around her in a seemingly random way that makes things more favorable for her and called the Domino Effect. There is still no release date set for the movie. Dennis, your thoughts on Zazie Beetz as Domino in Deadpool 2? Well, I haven't really watched that show, Atlanta, that she's in, that she's most well known for. Crime! <laughs> crime, crime, crime. How is, everyone else has watched it, right? Wow. I, yes. Not all of it, but Yes, I have. Okay. David, best show ever? It won some Golden Remotes. Yeah. Golden yeah, wow. it, was our, it was our number one comedy, I think, overall. Of yeah. 2016, mm-hmm. get yeah, on TV it. talk, yeah. So I don't too, know too much about her as an actress. I watch a clip of an upcoming movie she's in, mm. and she seems fine. I think my takeaway from this is that Domino is supposed to be kind of Cable's love interest, who is also going to be in Deadpool 2, who also probably will get his own spinoff movie or X-Force movie or whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's interesting they cast her before they casted Cable. Maybe they've casted Cable and we just don't know about it, just because there needs to be some on-screen chemistry between this character and whoever plays Cable. So that's my takeaway from it. Roca. I think Zazie's a great choice. I, I do watch Atlanta. It's a good, good show. I mean, it's one of these quiet shows that not a lot of people, unfortunately, watch, but it does get critically lauded, and she's fantastic on it. Mm-hmm. And so to see this casting, because I think they were looking at a couple of, they're looking at uh, uh, Janelle Monet as well from uh, Hidden Figures, and of course she's a singer as well. It, that would have been an awesome uh, casting choice as well. But this is this is an interesting choice because she's she's got a lot of strength to her, but she also has a very powerful vulnerability when she does the work in, in Atlanta. So I'm looking forward to see what she can do with the character of Domino. And you're right, Dennis, she is she is his occasional uh, lover for yeah. Cable, but mostly a sidekick and is supposed to give Deadpool a lot of crap through the whole time. Like, their relationship is very ball-busty, brother-sister type of relationship, and so uh, they had to find someone who could probably hang with Ryan. So she probably tested with Ryan more than she did with the Cable person, if they haven't cast the Cable person yet. Um, but I, I think this is a fantastic choice, and she's got a lot of range to bring this character to life. Nina Thurman has gone through a lot in the comics. So I look forward to seeing what she can do, sinking her teeth into this role, and then what's going to happen with her in X Force as well. Because you want to have these characters. I think that what they're doing with X Force is they're trying to get these characters who are going to kind of stake their claim without needing to be lost in the shuffle of the ensemble piece. And she's a person who will who could absolutely have her own storyline and have her own power in her scenes. Perry. Yeah, I watched uh, I watched most of Atlanta. I didn't mm. finish it. I don't know why, but I should go back and actually finish it. And she definitely stood out to me. Mm-hmm. And it's exciting to see them cast someone who's a little lesser known. Yeah. It just it says to me that they've got a lot of confidence her, in her, and they've got a lot of confidence in this character too. Because like, what a cool pairing, Domino and Deadpool with her yeah. abilities, and just you know th- the cinematic nature and the fun you could have with a role like that. So. I'm really excited for her. Looking back at all the casting rumors that have come our way, I was rooting for Mackenzie Davis only because I'm a huge Halt and Catch Fire fan and she's super talented. But if I don't get my way, I'm perfectly fine with the way that things panned out. I can't wait until we find out who's playing Cable. David, it's cool to see that television is kind of not not to plug TV talk, but it's cool to see that television. Is <laughs> really? Kind of, yeah. Oh, Mondays, Mondays, Mondays on, on uh, Collider. If you want to, if you want to see me on there with uh, Makuga and Sinead, of course. Um, but all these hot TV actors are getting good, you know, film roles. So yeah. you have Sterling K. Brown from uh, People vs. OJ, and This Is Us. 
He's going to be in Black Panther. Yeah. And now you have uh, Miss Beats here, who's now going to be in Deadpool. And she came off hot. Off looks like two of the hottest shows, Atlanta, People vs. OG, and of course, This Is Us, that are going right now. Donald Glover just won a Golden Globe for Atlanta. So it's great. Now he's got all, this, all these roles coming. So it's great to see all these actors getting this work. Also, I'm with Roca. I can't wait to see the X-Force film. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. excited because Logan, you know, rated R, doing well. Deadpool rated R, made tons of money. They should do this expert film right, make it rated R. I can't wait to see that. Well, Kinberg said in an interview that he, he he's like, if the <clears> film <throat> feels like it should be an R, then we're not afraid to go to R anymore because of Deadpool and Logan. So that can only bode well for X-Force if you're going to cast certain characters, or certain actors, rather, to play these characters. I like how they confirmed her casting, too. Ryan Reynolds yeah. on, what was it, Instagram or Twitter? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very simple little thing. It is very clever, though, and that's kind of, to me, signifying that they are going to have an epic campaign for this all over again. Yeah. And I can't wait for that. Yeah, yeah. He confirmed it with this cool like domino mm-hmm. graphic, which actually came out after our, our own friend here, Jeff Snyder, yes. who, who broke the story. And I guess they they figured it was going to go around. He just confirmed it. Uh, as far as the casting rumors from before, remember those were like during Tim Miller when Tim Miller was mm-hmm. still doing Deadpool too. That you had along with Mackenzie Davis, you had Lizzie Kaplan, you mm-hmm. had uh, Mary Elizabeth Weinstein. But yeah. obviously, when he departed. The film they they started back from scratch. Which, same yeah. with the cable thing because I think that's where those Kyle Chandler yeah. rumors were coming from. That was when Tim Miller was on board. Now it's uh, David Leach. Lynch. Yeah. So. Well, I, I think what you said about the TV actors is interesting too because, but it's on certain shows on certain networks. Like right, it's these harder edge shows, these more th- these more complex shows. Mm-hmm. They're showing what they can do with that kind of material. So it makes sense that they will make the natural jump into film. But television's yeah. being written almost like like a big movies now. We watch Game of Thrones, yeah, yeah. like a big you know, it's a big long film, yeah. And then vice versa, you have movies now because they're franchise universes. Right. So they're almost yeah. like episodes right. in a television series. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, what's next? Yesterday, we received our first look at Marvel's Thor Ragnarok, courtesy of EW, and now we have more details on the plot of the film. After the events of Age of Ultron, Thor flies off to figure out who was manipulating the Avengers and eventually hears about trouble in Asgard as his brother Loki has been impersonating his father, Odin. Loki's rather lax governing leads to the release of Hela, setting off the central plot of the movie. Thor's initial encounter with her gets him blasted to Sakaar, a barbaric planet ruled by the charming but nefarious Grandmaster. The God of Thunder is then forced into becoming a gladiator, which leads to his haircut and loss of his trusty hammer. <laughs> Perry, thoughts on some of the plot details from Thor Ragnarok? Well, most importantly, we clarified the hair stuff, so, yeah. you know, I'm ready for this movie now. It's, it's just been a really exciting week with Thor, uh, thanks to EW's exclusive, because not just the plot information, there are so many quotes from all the actors and from Taika Waititi just circulating around right now. And it's really exciting to get some concrete information because I feel like with this synopsis, we we figured it out for the mm-hmm. most part. It's just nice to hear it in a more official way where everything is kind of mapped out and pieced together. And I am just loving everything that I'm hearing about this so far. And I just lo- I love the the colors of all the images we've seen. I don't care what people are saying, Christian, about Jeff Goldblum <laughs> as uh, as that character. I- I, I see that character in that look, and that's something to me that suits Jeff Goldblum. And I also have had a crush on Jeff Goldblum since I was like teeny tiny and watching Jurassic Park, which is super <laughs> weird. But he can do no wrong in my book. So when I see what he looks like in this movie, it is fine by me. There are so many great quotes. I mean, if you haven't read the EW pieces, you probably should. A lot of great quotes from... Uh, Kate Blanchett on Hela and just the fact that she she's pretty much the first Marvel villain, mm-hmm. first Marvel <laughs> female villain, which is super exciting. There and there's a whole bunch of stuff on uh, on this planet that he goes to to see Jeff Goldblum and you know just like one little thing I highlighted was Hemsworth explaining that on that planet no one cares you know what prince or king Thor may have been in another world and. You know, it sounds like a really simple thing, but that's that's a nice little wrench to throw into just about everything we've seen him do in the MCU thus far. So there's just countless little tidbits all in these pieces that are really piquing my interest. And a lot of what people are saying about working with Taika Waititi and just, you know, there's a there's a quote from him. Now I'm paraphrasing because I didn't write this one down, of course. But just, you know, people expect a certain something from him given his past films, and that doesn't really right off the bat seem like it's going to mesh well with what we've gotten in the MCU, but 
it seems to me, based on what I'm reading, that we could get a really interesting happy medium where it seems like he does respect what came before this, but at the same time, he's going to hold true to what's his, and all the actors that are around him seem to respect what mm. he's done before. So just that whole group working together is really exciting. David? Yeah, I mean, I, I was sold on this from the get-go. I mean, as soon as I heard this was going to be a Thor, Hulk, buddy flick, I was sold. I mean, I was sad that we didn't get to see them, of course, in Civil War. But I love the little clips they've been releasing of Thor and his roommate, you yeah. know, uh, trying to uh, adjust to life, you know, not being an Avenger. And I just can't wait to see the whole kind of, we're getting to basically a Planet Hulk story mixed with a Thor story, you know? I mean, I know we've all wanted, we have, there's a Marvel animated movie of yeah. Planet Hulk, which yes. is fantastic. But now we're getting, you know, the Thor, Ragnarok, and that uh, Planet Hulk merged together, which I think is going to be really exciting to see. Also, we're kind of in need of a new iconic villain for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We, of course, you know, Loki was everybody's favorite for a while, but as much as I love Tom Hiddleston, I would nice to see some new blood. You know, maybe can Kate Blanchett, you know, be that, you know, as hell? I think she could be a good addition. Also, now we have confirmation. I think we all knew this, but Doctor Strange is going to be involved. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're going to be bringing in more because this is where Thanos resides. I mean, if anything's going to link us to Thanos besides Guardians, I mean, it's definitely going to be the Thor universe. So, yeah. I mean, I'm all on board. And Taco Watiti, I, I can't wait mm. to see what it's, it's going to look like. I think it's going to be gorgeous. Yeah. Well, I, I do think Jeff Goldblum looks, Jeff Goldblum lo does look ridiculous. However, you know, with still photos, it's always tough to tell. Like, there's always still photos of people in costumes that, like, once in context, once you see it in motion, mm -hmm. you, you know, I remember with the Magneto in, in X-Men First Class, those pictures came out, and a lot of people, including myself, didn't think they looked that great. But oh, then yeah. when you see them on screen, sometimes it, it, it's a lot different. So I think, but, but with Jeff Goldblum, <laughs> Perry, he can do Watch some what you say right now. Watch can, what you say. <laughs> he can do some wrong because you saw Independence Day resurgence. Oh, stop so, it. So I, I know it's one of uh, you know, Roka's favorite movies. I just movies. knew it was going yeah. He was the reason I, I kept watching. There. He was great yeah. in that but movie. But he, you know, he, he was, was great in the movie. He was actually good in the movie. Yes. It's, it's not his fault that script was garbage. Well. I don't think. <laughs> well, watch what you say. Watch uh, what you say. But yeah, yeah, the, those pictures came out that EW, EW's covers are always ugly. I, I don't like them. They're always terrible. It's a terrible cover. Um, but seeing the pictures, they kind of remind me of like when you watch a show or a movie where they have like some sort of alternate reality yeah. to, to mm -hmm. timeline. And then looking at Thor here, it's like, oh, it's Thor, but he's different. He's got different hair, got a different costume. So maybe it is bringing something fresh to, to the franchise. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, it's not all about long hair. Let me just tell you something. As a guy with short hair all the time, it's all right. This is nice. This is nice. I like it. He looks good. He's a man. My God. If you see Chris, that's a man. <laughs> like, I, I don't I don't mind admitting this. Like, it's, I got a little bit of a crush on that guy. He's, yes. He seems like a really cool <laughs> yeah, dude. Really you know, yeah. when it, he seems like a really cool dude you could have a beer with. And just those that those things with, just at the end of Doctor Strange, when they have that little scene, which is so great at the post credit scene, and then and the little vignettes that they have, he just seems like a cool dude. And with the short hair, he looks great. It looks fantastic. And so this, I'm excited for this. Are you hitting on Chris Hemsworth? I, I would absolutely. Hey, the shorter the I would, better, man. That's I, what I I'm talking about. I would go to a movie with Chris Hemsworth absolutely, <laughs> and buy him dinner. But like Tessa Thompson, I love that she's in this too. Mm -hmm. I just saw Creed again last week. I absolutely love that movie. She's so good in these films. And so I'm excited for this. I like that Watiti said this is essentially rebooting Thor. I know, so I know of all the properties in the MCU, individual properties, people have had this issue with the first two Thor films, especially the second one or the first two. <clears> it all depends. But this is Watiti like starting over again and taking advantage advantage of Hemworth's natural ability to be funny in certain moments. We see this in the Avengers movies with him and Hulk, mm -hmm. so it just seemed natural to put them together. And the fact that he's using uh, one of the movies he listed, uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which is one of my favorite movies as a template for what they're creating with their with their with their uh, mm -hmm. buddy road uh, space trip film, whatever they're doing there, it makes me it gets me even more excited. And this idea of a planet, we don't know what these creatures are going to be what, that they're going to fight. So I'm excited to see what they come up with. Are they going to just transplant them out of Planet Hulk storyline, or are they going to create new characters, new creatures, new new warriors, new gladiators to fight in this in this planet? So so much about this is exciting, and I don't mind the Goldblum thing at all, because if anybody can make weird work, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum can make weird work. I mean, he made you care about a fly that was half human, half fly at the end of the fly. That's a fantastic Ooh, actor. Me. That's a fantastic actor. Don't kill Brendel Fly. He's just so great. <laughs> and so I, 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 I know he looks ridiculous in this, but, it, but if anyone can make that work, it's Jeff Goldblum. All right, guys. Now moving on to buy or sell. What's our first topic? <clears throat> 
With the theatrical release of Beauty and the Beast just around the corner, Disney is already gearing up for their next live-action reboot, Aladdin. THR confirms that the studio has recently sent out a casting call looking for Middle Eastern actors ages 18 to 25, 25 for the lead roles of Jasmine and Aladdin. Guy Ritchie is attached to direct the film, which will reportedly have a six-month filming period in the UK from July 2017 to January 2018, with rehearsals beginning in April. A release date for the movie has not been announced. With this casting notice, buy or sell that Disney is seemingly casting a pair of unknowns for Aladdin. Oh, th- I'm I'm excited for this. I think this is the right way to go. I'm sure there are plenty of Middle Eastern actors between 18 and 25 years old who can submit for this, who are already working professionally in numerous films. I mean, the Middle Eastern market for films, there are some fantastic films that come out of there that are able to come out of there and get seen here in the States or on some uh, streaming sites. You should definitely explore that community. There's a lot of great film there. So I think this is fantastic to open this up. It also brings a lot more publicity to the film, and Disney can, like, go through this and see, and, you know, it can highlight it. You could probably turn it into a reality show if they wanted to uh, and put on ABC or something. Like, there's certain... uh, Things that, that it just conveys the fact that they are open and they don't want to whitewash the uh, the situation. They want to make sure they find people of a Middle Eastern heritage to be in this. Uh, for me personally, I kind of like this weird idea. I know I'm I'm too old to be saying this, but Zayn Malik would be an interesting choice. He's oh, Middle Eastern. Boy. He's from One Direction. That's a great casting hmm. situation. You bring in that whole market. Who knows if he can act yeah. or not? Hmm. And then, uh, but uh, I mean, Riz Ahmed would have been interesting too. But I think I don't know if he qual- he's of, of Egyptian descent, so that might be. He could play the kind of stumbly guy who comes out on top. We saw that already in in Rogue One. Um, And Dev Patel, my God, if you could get Dev Patel coming off a lion would be fantastic. Maybe even reunite him with the actress uh, Frida Pinto from Slumdog if you wanted to play that whole Mm -hmm. thing out. But I know they're, I think they're both Indian, so they don't necessarily qualify because India is considered part of Asia. So that kind of stuff. But there's certainly possibilities here, and I'm excited about them doing it this way because it makes it seem like Disney's trying to be all-inclusive, and it's a smart PR move, if nothing else. Perry? You were doing so well until you dropped Zayn Malik's well, name. I, I, I mean, if you're I, Disney, I, I don't even know. He can who sing. That is. Yeah, he I know can who sing. He can yeah, sing. sing as well. Yeah, he was the one that left One Direction. That's right. I mean, oh. he can sing, and you know, I shouldn't knock his acting abilities. I've never seen the kid act. Neither it's have just I. What's most exciting to me about this story, and which is why I'm buying it. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm glad to hear that whitewashing is not an issue with this movie, but right. it is super exciting that they're going to cast unknowns. And you know, just because they put a casting call out does not mean they are definitely going to cast cast right. the movie this way right. but the fact that they're giving it a shot makes me really excited because Wendy how do you pronounce from from Moana her name Ali, Ali e. Carvalho thank you I'm never going to say it out loud I'm always going to ask Wendy to say it for me but <laughs> look, look at her I mean yeah. she is one heck of a fine and even though you know she got to perform at the Oscars I'm sure many people are learning her name now but because that was an animated movie you know, I, I think she deserves a little more credit than mm-hmm. she's even getting for that. But if you cast two unknowns in a live action Aladdin, these people are going to blow up. Mm-hmm. Look at how Beauty and the Beast is tracking. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we're going to be in a situation where, oh, if you cast unknowns by the time Aladdin comes out, it's not going to do well because it doesn't have an Emma Watson. That's not going to be the case here at all. <laughs> these people are going to become super, super famous if they do cast two unknown actors. So I just want them to find the best possible people because Aladdin is one of my favorite Disney classics of yeah, all time. Absolutely. I mean, this, this is like tense times for me because uh, it's Aladdin and the Lion King that... Mm. Those are the one. I mean, I grew up watching a lot of them. Those are the two that I watched on repeat that I have very vivid memories of mm-hmm. seeing in the theater, owning all the toys. They were very important parts of my childhood. So please do it right. This seems like a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah I'm going to buy this as well. And you had uh, Dan Lin, the producer, talking yeah. about, yeah, they don't want another Prince of Persia situation. <laughs> and also, you know, you had a movie last, uh, last year with uh, Jungle Book yeah. where you had an unknown child be the lead of the star. I mean, obviously you had... Bill Murray and Ben Kingsley as as these other characters, but really you only seen the character uh, that uh, what, what was his name? We had him do Neil Sethi, mm-hmm. like he in that movie one was fantastic and yeah. two made a lot of money. So it, there is no certain formula where it's like oh you have to cast uh, certain stars and, or or else it won't make any money. Um, the one concern I have is with with Guy Ritchie doing this. Yeah. I just you know maybe after I see his what's that. King Arthur movie that's mm-hmm. coming out soon. Like <laughs> that's been delayed. Yeah, yeah. Lot, yeah. like I don't know. Like that maybe if bad. I see that, I, 
I'll change my mind, but as of right now, I just don't see how he's a fit. David? I hope this is like a resurgence for Guy Ritchie because Snatch is one of my favorite yeah. films of all time and Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels. Like He's a good director. Um, he has a certain style. I, I even like the Sherlock Holmes Who movies. doesn't? I, I thought they were a lot of fun. I, I enjoy them. So I think maybe if he can come back on board with this, maybe he can find some new life. You know, maybe it seems like a, a project just kind of ignite, you know, whatever that old spark is uh, that he used to have. But Dennis, I agree with you. Like the Jungle Book casting, you don't need necessarily a huge name to sell a movie. Like, look like when, I mean, when Avatar came out, I mean, Sam Worthington wasn't that big at that time. Sam Worthington still isn't he that still big. He's still that big. You know, he's, he's in the shack, you know, for he's getting work. But um, <laughs> movie, you know, uh, Jungle Book still made $900 million over that. Yeah. So I think this can definitely be a success. I can't wait to see Little Mermaid. Yeah. I want to see Little Mermaid. Yeah. Um, I'd love to see another like Sword in the Stone. I mean, there's so many movies they can pull from here. I'm just glad we're getting more of these Disney live action films. Just to give Sam Worthington <laughs> a little credit, he I was, like Sam he was yeah. very good in Hacksaw Ridge. He's just never going to become the thing that I think he was intended no, to right. be. Yeah, there was a, a good year or two where he was yeah. like the lead in a lot of big franchise tentpole movies. Yeah, Eric Bana, Worthington, Josh Lucas, they all go in that basket of close but not quite there. Mm -hmm. you know? and, That's a really sad who's, basket. Who's gonna pull? No, hey, I'd like to be close and not there. You're still yeah, making still that money. Paid, yeah. Hey, who, yeah. who, who, I wonder who they're going to cast Genie. That's really the big one, right? I yeah, mean, that's, that's well, the one that's yeah. really going to Can't replace Robin Williams. No. Yeah. They go a bit Easter. Maybe DJ Kali, maybe. I'm on, maybe. Oh, oh no. DJ Kali. Is <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm uh, on one? Sinead, what, what do you think about this? <laughs> Tell them what we saw. Um, <laughs> someone in the, the chat is so crazy today, first of all, but some of them are so funny. But I just read... Um, someone goes, young Kim Kardashian no. as Jafar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's terrible. Perfect. But I laughed. I you like guys are it. so funny sometimes. We just sit here and giggle at all your comments. <laughs> um, no, I think it's cool. I, I want um, Aladdin and Jasmine to be played by... Um, to people of Middle Eastern descent. I think that's the right way to do it. I don't care who it is as long as they can act, whether it's unknown or not. Like, it's not going to bug me. I think Disney's in a really good position to cast unknowns right now because they have huge properties that regardless of who is playing them, people are going to watch it. Mm -hmm. Like, more so than anything else, right? If someone's okay with the movie, they'd be like, Ugh, I don't know if I want to see this now. People are going to be buying tickets to Aladdin and every other Disney reboot that they do um, or remake live action remake so I think they're in a really good position to try doing unknowns I think it's really cool and also it's a great way for Disney just to meet people of Middle Eastern descent that might not even be actors right yeah. or meet people of different backgrounds just because it's an excuse for someone to get out and just try something new someone who might have never thought about acting ever sees a casting notice that is like specifically for Middle Eastern people between 18 and 25 and they're like okay cool maybe I should do this so I just think it's a great way just to get more diversity in Hollywood regardless because if you don't book Aladdin or Jasmine, maybe they'll call you back for something else and there's right. nothing wrong with more diversity. Wendy? I totally agree. I am so happy that they are going forward with casting specifically Middle Easterns for the roles of Jasmine and Aladdin. And just like how Disney discovered Ali, um, it's the same way. And there's so many talented people, young people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And this could be their breakout role, just like it happened for Daisy Ridley, too. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. so I, I am all for this. And I'm, I am a little biased. I kind of want Ashley Mova to go I know, I was audition. just thinking, like, we got <laughs> we to gotta work on her audition with her. Yeah, <laughs> somebody's got to coach her. Yeah. You know, and I am also not really selling the idea for, of Zayn as Aladdin. Like, I, I, I didn't think about it until you said, mm -hmm. I don't know if he can act, but... Yeah. You know, if you could, it wouldn't be a bad choice. And, you, and it's a built-in audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have no clue who you're talking about. I mean, I'm <laughs> serious. Oh, I'll show you after, Dennis. Don't worry, I got about. I got YouTube videos on YouTube videos. Uh, I'll show you after. Right. Yeah, I'll make sure to check those out right now. All right, let's move on. Uh, fair enough. All right, director Shane Black has taken to Twitter to share another new image from the set of <laughs> The Predator. The shot of the cast teases the main players who will be featured in the movie with an ominous warning from Black himself, who added... Stone killers with serious acting chops, but which of them will be chopped by the Predator? See what I did there? Filming is currently underway in Vancouver with the movie set to open in theaters on February 9th, 2018. David, do you buy or sell the new image from the Predator? I do buy it. It looks like we're kind of going back to the uh, old school style of, you know, just Predator, like the Predator. You know, I think we try to go maybe a little too far into the Predator universe, you know, especially with that second Alien versus Predator. I think it was called oh, Requiem. Yeah. Requiem. Remember at the beginning of that movie, there's just some Predator dude looking at the sky and it gets an alert and he's like, I got to do something. You know, I got to go to go to Earth and messes everything up. 
I'd like to see more about the predator life. Like, I mean, are, are there predator ma mail deliverers? Do they have like sure. you know predator Amazon? Sure. You know, I mean, are there pizza delivery guys? <laughs> sure. But I think it, you know, at the same time, we need to get back to the basics of what made Predator great. And the first Predator is still for me my favorite with Arnold Schwarzenegger, dudes in the jungle, messing, you know, just on, you know, just being hunted by Predator. Can they beat him? Can they not? And I think mm -hmm. this is what it's getting back to basics. And they have an excellent cast here. Boyd Hol Holbrook really proved a lot to me in The Wolverine. I didn't know much about him outside of what well, he was in Tron, Logan. right? It was Tron. in Narcos. Narcos, Tron yeah. Legacy, but I just I was never really impressed by him necessarily. But in this movie, in The Wolverine, he was fantastic. Also, we got Sterling it's called, K. It's called, it's called Logan. Logan. David. It's called Logan. Logan. David. Did I say The Wolverine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's for TV. Oh my gosh, I'm Same sorry. The Wolverine's sorry. on TV. Sorry about Logan that. I'm sorry. I got my, my TV talks all over. They say <laughs> Logan was fantastic. He was great in that. Also, Sterling K. Brown. We're getting him yeah. again mm -hmm. from This Is Us and People vs. Ojo, like I said. And uh, sorry, one more person I wanted to mention. Oh, also. Uh, uh, Trevante Rhodes from Moonlight was yeah. an incredible actor. So the cast is awesome. And we're getting back to the Predator, hunting dudes, and it should be fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to buy it as well. You forgot Alfie Allen. Uh, Alfie Allen, Theon Greyjoy. Greyjoy. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, Game of Thrones, more TV. Also going to be in the yeah. movie. I, I hope he plays a different character. We've already seen what he does, right. and he's fantastic on Game of Thrones. <clears throat> he plays a similar type character in John Wick, so mm -hmm. I'd like to see him maybe play it someone that maybe has a little more <laughs> backbone in, in mm. this one is actually like a, a, a likable and, and, and good guy. Yeah, you, you you know, you talked about it before uh, in one of the previous topics about these television actors. You have Boy, Boyd Holbrook, he was from Narcos. You have Sterling K. Brown in, in this as well, Alfie Allen. Yeah, this is a, a Keegan-Michael Key is in this. Mm. So yeah. I, I'm liking this cast, I'm liking where this is headed. Uh, Roka? I, I love this, and I think this picture, to be honest with you, I don't want to start any kind of trouble, but like this is very similar to the Ocean's 8 picture, but I like this picture a little bit better. It conveys just a little yeah. more of what they're going for in the mm. film. Do you know what I'm saying? This idea of them in this kind of rugged situation, in the back of what looks like a, 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 what, a transport or a carrier or some, a bus of some kind. This looks great. Just the way they're leaning in, the way they're all looking at the camera, dialed into what's happening. Do you know what I'm saying? So um, I love the casting. And you're right. Everyone seems to be from TV. Mm -hmm. In this entire cast, uh, Keegan Michael Key, even uh, Olivia Munn, who was in Newsroom, right? These are all these mm -hmm. uh, actors, and Yvonne Strahovski, who was on Chuck. I love that Strahovski's in this. So to me, it seems to, to me that he is approaching this in the right way, which is he understands that people are coming to have a great time and laugh and enjoy themselves and also get into the action. Mm -hmm. And I think you cast Keegan Michael Key. For that reason, I think you cast these kinds of actors, Strahovski, Alfie Allen, these guys can play comedy in certain moments. So they, they worked and serious stuff as well. So I'm looking forward to see what they do. And this looks like an A-list movie, finally, instead of the original, which was B-list, which we've already covered and accepted. And everyone, is, <laughs> everyone has agreed to it, because you know, Schwarzenegger. Uh, and I'm like, this seems more like a combo of two and one, because two was set in the inner city. You had Paxton, yeah. you had Danny Glover. This was It was more regular human beings. None of these guys look like they've been lifting weights like Schwarzenegger for 30 years like this looks more realistic and so I, I i'm super excited and shane black can do no wrong in my opinion i just can't Perry. i'm gonna buy it that's a fine image i mean mm. if we're just talking about the image here there's really not much to it except for the fact that i just want to be on that bus and hang out with them <laughs> you know it's a <laughs> you got so distracted by how you explain what a bus some sort of like transportation dream well oh, this thing on wheels that gets you from point a to point b it's i don't know <laughs> <knowledge. I'm laughs> trying to get the terminology right <laughs> But th I mean, this looks this looks rock solid. It's it's a cool look at the cast. I just love the lineup here. So I mean, that's pretty much what it comes down to. I'm most excited, I think, for Travante Rhodes. I'm dying mm. to see him in something other other than Moonlight now yeah. and see what he's capable of, which I'm sure is quite a bit. And I mean, really, everybody else. When you look around at this group here, there's just so many people that are special actors for different reasons. So I'm really looking forward to seeing them come together as a group. This thing is shaping up well. I want it now. All right, what's next? People Magazine has revealed some new characters and the voices that will be bringing them to life in the upcoming Disney and Pixar production of Cars 3. As far as cast is concerned, Nathan Fillon has been added as brilliant business car named Sterling, Carrie Washington as a sports car named Natalie Certain, and Orange is the new black star Leah Delaria as a character named Miss Fritter. They join returning voices of Owen Wilson as Lightning McQueen, Larry the Cable Guy as Mater, and Bonnie Hunt's Sally. Cars 3 hits theaters on June 16, 2017. Dennis, buy yourself the new cast additions for Cars 3. I buy it in the sense of I like these additions. I like the people that are, are joining this team, Nathan Fillion especially. I believe he can ham it up for this role. But I sell it in the sense that it's going to actually make me want to see Cars 3. I just 
don't really have that much interest in this mm. franchise. Maybe if I I hear a lot of buzz and people are saying that that this one has gotten because even the even the first one, like I even that got okay uh, reviews. Mm. I, I just found it a little a little boring. It wasn't bad. And then the second one, a lot of people didn't like that <laughs> one. Just just not really interested in this mm. franchise. Perry, I actually think this is a pretty big deal. This is really important casting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't even make a joke well, about this. Oh, you're being I, funny. Oh, you're trying I, to be funny. I, I, I don't oh, know. Gosh. I can't believe I actually like had you guys going. I couldn't care less about cars. I just don't care. I, I never, I've seen both of the, the, the first two movies once. I mean, I guess I'll have to buy it just because these are fine actors. There's, there's no reason not to trust them voice acting cars, but I just don't care about this movie. <laughs> Roka, <laughs> I couldn't be I couldn't be more polar opposite than, than oh, uh, surprise, Perry, surprise. right? Yeah, right. In my transport, I uh, know I, I I like this idea because I love Carrie Washington <laughs> and anything that Carrie Washington does. And I know that she voiced Princess Shuri in the Black Panther series, the animated series. She has experience doing that, and Nathan obviously does with Green Lantern and Robot Chicken and numerous other things that he's done voiceover work for. So Halo. to me. Huh? Halo. Halo, yes, mm-hmm. of course. And that, yeah, and so all that stuff works to yeah, me, right. and it brings the kind, of, it brings the right weight, and and to these characters, like these parts, you, you cast these actors who are really, really good actors, and then you give them these parts to play. It adds a lot more of a foundation to the mm-hmm. film, and I think what you're saying is right, Dennis. Uh, this and you as well, Perry. There's this property doesn't get the kind of love that other uh, uh, Pixar properties does, but they sell a crap ton of toys. Oh yeah, that's why they keep and, going. That's why that's they why keep they, going yeah. exactly, mm-hmm. and so. Uh, I have a feeling just from that first initial 53 second trailer, whatever it was, of him flipping over and having the accident, that they're going into deeper territory, a little more complex territory with this, which they haven't been able to do in this property, in this franchise, as powerfully as they do in other ones. And so I think you want to cast actors that are going to bring that kind of complexity and and levels acting to the voice work. And I think Kerry Washington and Nathan Fillion are great choices to do that. David, are you waiting in line for this movie? No, no, not waiting in line, (laughs) but no, I, I do buy the casting, of course. I mean, the incredible actors, Kerry Washington, more TV stars. Yes, I mean, she's true. huge on Scandal on Thursday nights. I mean, she mm-hmm. just kills it every time. She's a great actress. Definitely good in voice work. Nathan Fillion is the king. I mean, obviously, Firefly. Uh, love him. But, um, yeah, I'm just not... Uh, Cars is my least favorite franchise in the Pixar universe. Um, but they, they just do a good job with their movies, t- typically. So I like the trailer, though. I enjoyed the trailer, yeah. like you said, Roka. So if it's good, if I hear some buzz, like Dennis said, people say, hey, David, did you go check it out? I'll go check it out. But right now, I'm, I'm not going to buy my ticket quite yet. Okay. All right, what's next? According to a report from Deadline, Danny DeVito is in talks for Disney and director Tim Burton's live-action Dumbo remake. DeVito would play Medici, a man who runs the small circus that gets taken over by an evil big-top circus run by the film's main villain, Vandermeer. DeVito would possibly join Ava Green in a movie planned to blend CGI and live-action. The screenplay is written by Transformers scribe Aaron Kruger, with the release date yet to be determined. Perry, buy or sell the addition of Danny DeVito to Dumbo. After that image that Ray made, I think I have to buy it. <laughs> it's got creepy, creepy Burton looks. It's creepy. It's all there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to buy this because I love Tim Burton. I love Danny DeVito. And I'm curious to see what their version of Dumbo is going to look like. That is not to say that I think Tim Burton and Dumbo might have been the right pairing. It's actually really interesting that we're talking about both this and uh, and Guy Ritchie directing mm-hmm. Aladdin. Because Disney is having so much success with a very straightforward retelling of all their classic movies. And now we've got two directors with very, very specific styles taking over other classic uh, adaptations. So... I'm curious to see if the studio heads kind of let them go for it or if they try to rein them in and keep it a little more in line with what we know these stories to be. I doubt it's going to happen with Burton, especially Mm -hmm. because of the the success of Alice in Wonderland, although I I know the second Mm -hmm. one didn't do well. But with with Guy Ritchie, I'd be curious to see him kind of keep in line because he's so he's so particular about his style i would you know it it sounds like you're putting him in a box in a way but maybe that is a way to just you know expand his Mm -hmm. repertoire and do something different but back to this story in particular i mean i'm a big penguin fan i have vivid vivid memories again of going to the theater as a child and i was very young when batman returns came out and when i saw danny devito as the penguin It gave me nightmares, and I loved, I I really, I love having nightmares, actually. So Mm. I grew very fond of the two of them working together. So I'm excited to see what they do here. David? 
I, I definitely buy this for sure. Um, I'm happy to see, like Perry said, just like Burton and DeVito teaming up again. That movie was terrifying, like Perry said. I mean, for me, Batman Returns, I don't know if the rest of you out there, but I thought I was young. Everything about that movie was terrifying. I love the the look of it, that steel, that mm-hmm. kind of dark, you know, just black look. I mean, you had, I mean, Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer was terrifying. She was sexy, but she had like a whip. And as a young man, I'm like, I don't know what all this whip and black leather kind of terrified me. You know, I'm a little guy. I don't know what's going on there, but she was hot. And, you know, DeVito was fantastic. Sorry, I'm getting a little too you, deep here. You, you too had much some information. conflicted feelings. Too much information. There. Conflicted yeah. feelings. Um, what's going but, on in my pants? No, sorry, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that touch too far? I don't understand. <laughs> but but uh, yes. DeVito was fantastic. Um, I'm just I'm just glad, like I said, we're just getting these. I mean, I think these live action adaptations are the right move for Disney. Roca. Yeah, this is great. I absolutely buy this too. I think Danny DeVito is going to bring that kind, right kind of grab. And grab it. Uh, I don't want to say it because people are going <laughs> to grab it. 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 We should have a gravitas <laughs> jar it's a on good Friday word. shows. Just <laughs> every time you say you got to put a dollar in the gravitas, and then we can buy, we can buy pizza right? with the money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a good point, Wendy. Good point. <laughs> okay, fine. I like the idea of Danny DeVito. I love this. I buy it completely because if anyone's going to convey uh, the owner of a circus. Danny DeVito has that kind of vibe to him. And I like that he's not the main villain. I like that mm. he might just be a, a good guy in this situation, caught up against the main villain. I like cheering for Danny DeVito, you know, ever since Taxi. You know, I've been such a fan of his and it's the parts he it's plays. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. He's, yeah, he's, right. He's, he kills he's, it on Which re- resuscitated his career yeah. mm-hmm. completely. And so this is so fu- this is a great addition. And I, you're right. As, as a guy who's worked with Tim Burton before, he brings the vibe that Burton is looking for. There's a shorthand already there between them. And yes, I'm not as... I wasn't as young as these two fools over here when I went to see Batman Returns. I actually went on a date to that. But like Ooh. that's that I love what Danny DeVito was able to do in that role as Penguin. It was great. And so he's got the right vibe to go forward with this. And I, I think we're going to have some great, mo- really, really great moments of connection between him and Dumbo. And maybe there's a love story between him and Ava Green, which is kind of weird, but hey, it's Hollywood. It, you know, May, September, that happens all the time. But like, I, I think the, he, he will have the right kind of, uh, 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 you can you connect him on a human level mm-hmm. and feel his pain through the course of the movie. And so who knows? I mean, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with, the, with him in that part. Yeah, I, I'm going to buy it as well. Like you mentioned, Danny DeVito, he really resurrected his career on uh, It's Always Sunny. Mm. And what I like in that role is he goes for it. Like, yeah. if you ever watch that show, like, there's a lot of stuff that, like, you're like, wow, this mm-hmm. is what Danny DeVito is willing to do just to get, to get the joke. I haven't really seen him in a, in a dramatic role in a while. The last one yeah. I can think of is is uh, Heist. Yeah. Um, where he played uh, kind of like the villain. I, I really liked him in that. Uh, Tim Burton, I didn't see Miss Peregrine's... Uh, Home for peculiar children. children. Like I thought, Big Eyes was okay. I didn't didn't care for Alice in Wonderland, so I'm interested to see what he does. The one part that worries me is the screenplay is by Aaron Kruger, who Mm -hmm. uh, Roka, you should know what he he does, which is uh, he he writes screenplays for the Transformer franchise. So I'm more excited. I'm even more excited now. So, I'm even more excited to so see So that worries me somewhat. <laughs> uh, like, maybe maybe he's a really good screenwriter, and he just kind of, like, for that one, he, you know, like... Uh, you blame Michael Bay for that one? No, he? no, maybe he, he just, He was like, working so hard on Dumbo, and he was just or, like, or, whatever. Or Transformers. Transformers. He sits in a room for about 30 minutes and, like, takes some crayons and scratches How them. dare you? <laughs> Who knows? Who you knows what write, happens? You can't you know? write and a three-hour movie and in 30 co- minutes. And collects it. <laughs> when you throw random word, words at the, you know, type like this, then yeah, yeah, you can. You just put um, gravitas in there yeah, and just throw yeah, that in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, right. uh, but I That's do, enough. <laughs> but, uh, but I do enjoy, I do buy this pairing. I, yeah. I like that they're reconnecting. <laughs> and, 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 David did nice work in Renaissance Man. Like he, I think he has a he he does these parts where he ha, he has these like weightier top weightier mm-hmm. roles in films that are not necessarily as weighty as the stuff he's bringing mm-hmm. to him. So he does great. And of course in Big Fish, he was you know really moving in that part as mm-hmm. well. So he can certainly play the walk the line between the two because obviously it's going to be Dumbo. It's not going to be a super downer of a film. And they've got to have some kind of joy and fun. And I think he can play both parts well in these kinds of films. Mm-hmm. All right, what's next? According to THR, Sony Pictures is set to acquire the rights to the upcoming book, Hunting El Chapo, the thrilling inside story of the American lawman who captures the world's most wanted drug lord. The powerful drug trafficker, El Chapo, was recently extradited to the United States and is known for his escapes from prison. He ran the Sinaloa cartel and is considered the most powerful drug trafficker in the world by the United States Department of Treasury. The report also mentions that director Michael Bay is at the top of the list for directors wanted for 
the film. Roca, buy or sell a movie based on El Chapo and possibly directed by your favorite Michael Bay. Well, I mean, could I buy this more? I, I absolutely buy this. Uh, El Chapo is such an interesting character through... Uh, through the year, through the last couple of decades, you're hearing about him, and I've watched a number of documentaries about uh, the stuff that he's done down there. I mean, Cartel Land is one of those ones that you need to watch. It's on Netflix. It'll blow your mind. We've seen with the stuff like this with Narcos. We've seen Ego Ramirez play Carlos. We've seen Benicio del Toro, and obviously Che wasn't a drug runner, but like this idea of these characters that are powerful in the Latino community coming out and have some kind of some kind of a background to them that that crosses all kinds of spectrums and all is international, and so. El Chapo has this kind of following too. <clears throat> Plus, he keeps escaping from prison. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's involved with him. And if you saw Sicario, you see what is possible if you really explore the idea of drug cartels in a film. Like how deep and, and gory and disgusting and, mm -hmm. and scary you can convey th that world to be on film. And so I hope in the hands of Michael Bay, because I really like what he did with 13 Hours. I like what he did in Pain and Gain. He has ability to play these, to, to direct these films that are that are bigger in scope, but smaller in approach. And I, and I think he's the right choice. He's a great choice for this. And who knows what he's going to do with it. It all depends on casting. Well, I'm available. I think I'm in the age range to play Chapo. So I could play him, you know, put a little more weight and whatever. <laughs> but like, I, I like this idea. And apparently there's a competing one with Ridley Scott. Yeah. So obviously this is a guy who has a, a lot mm. of attention and interest in the mainstream uh, to create two films for him and why not explore this and I hope they don't turn him into a hero like Marco Cor Michael Corleone or something like really do an honest portrayal of this person I just worry what kind of um, hassle the production is going to get in making these kinds of films because mm. people revere this man people revere this man in certain sections of the Latino world and so wherever they shoot whatever they do I, I just worry if they're going to be able to pull off two productions about this man. Well, I'm selling this. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, the story is interesting, but you're you're talking about Michael Bay handling what I think should be a crime drama hmm. thriller. <laughs> you're talking about. I, I don't think what what's going to happen. I don't think they're going to make him like a heroic figure, especially because the book is written from the standpoint of them yeah. hunting him down. Right. I think there's a lot of dramatic tension in there that I don't think that Michael Bay really is suited for. He does action films you know he doesn't do things in like with slow burns and you know a lot of you know i just think you know you're comparing something like sicario with a director like denis Villeneuve yeah. to, to michael bay i just don't see a match there david yeah i'm gonna say I, I buy i buy el chapel uh the movie again it says possibly attached mm -hmm. to it so he's not like confirmed so yeah, yeah. michael bay I, I was a huge fan of The Rock. I know that's way back in the day. I love Bad Boys too. Yeah. Like I would love to see a Bad Boys stream. I know you guys were talking about that on Movie Talk the other day. I would love to see that. Yeah. But Michael Bay's not the most subtle guy in the world. He's not the most subtle guy in the world. He's very in your face. You know, like big, big and bold. That, that's how he does his Transformers, and it's it makes billions. A lot of people go see his films. A lot of people like him. Um, but for this kind of a movie, I agree with Dennis. I'd rather go with the Denny Villeneuve or somebody like that. A little more subtlety in there. Get that tension because Sicario was so tense. It was so good. Yes. That, that was one of your favorite movies when it came out. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. So My favorite I, of the year. I'd, year. I'd love to see somebody like that take this movie. Perry? Yeah, I... I, I, f I feel funny completely selling it because it's uh, it's Michael Bay that is ruining the story for me a little bit. I, I think this idea has big screen potential. I mean, clearly it has big screen potential because not only is there this one that we're talking about and that competing one, even though that competing one, I don't think there's been news about it since mm. July 2015 with Ridley Scott. Mm. But then there was a time where uh, Peter Berg was attached to Ooh. direct one as well. And it's funny with those three people, because those are three people that are used to working with, you know, big mm -hmm. budgets and, and famous, famous faces. And I picture this a little more, you know, being better suited for so someone like a Denis Villeneuve, someone who, who you know, a, a quieter, a quieter, and slow burn is probably the right, the right term, a slow burn approach to something mm -hmm. like this. I don't, I don't really want to see the Michael Bay version. I, but I, I, I like that Peter Berg choice, though, because Peter Berg, Kind of reminds me of Michael Bay a little well, bit. Peter but Berg like also captures... had one heck of a year. Yeah, Patriots I, I've Day got a lot of faith yeah. in Peter Berg. Yeah. Although, you know, that was his report was from 2014, right. so I don't know if that's yeah. ever going to happen. But and like with the with the Ridley Scott one, he's pretty knee deep in alien. Now he said he wants to do six moment. alien so films or something. Like I don't that? think that's going to happen anytime soon yeah. either. But I'm just I'm curious to see if any of these ever come together, or if this is just a case of someone wanting to snatch up the rights to something mm. and hold tight to it mm. in fear of somebody else getting it. Mm -hmm. 
All right, uh, let's move on. Before we get on to mailbag, I'll remind you we're gonna take your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video at the end of the show, and Wendy will pick out a few. Also, want to mention we have a new schmodown coming out today between William Bibiani versus Elliot Dewberry. That will be up at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Yesterday, we had an all new Jedi Council. Also, today is a brand new episode of Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns which will be on uh, the Go90, Verizon's Go90 network. You can go to go90.com. Uh, also want to mention that you know a lot of people who are international fans have said that they aren't able to see this show. You can actually watch them. Not They aren't new, but they, they usually come out a week later uh, on the Go90 YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see older episodes, also want to mention that we actually segmented out uh, our La La Land sketch, La La Land in real life. That was directed by myself. That was written by Josh McCuga, edited by by Thad here uh, at Collider Video. Uh, we put that on our YouTube channel. You can check that out. Um, now let's move on to mailbag. Sinead, what do we got? Lou Bloom writes, what's up, Collider crew? Greetings from Brazil. I watch Movie Talk every day. Big fan of TV Talk and Nightmares as well. My question is about cinematography. Almost everywhere I see people talking about it. They talk about how beautiful it is and the use of colors and that kind of stuff. But shouldn't they include camera movements and shooting techniques as well? For example, there are many Emmanuel Lubezki movies with amazing long takes, a.k.a. oneers, a scene shot in a single take. But the directors are the ones who take the credit. Is this right? Shooting techniques and camera movements should be credited to the DP or to the director. And speaking of long takes, which ones are your favorites? I love Children of Men's Car Chase. Thanks and keep up the good work. Mm. Perry, mm. what do you think? Who, who, who should get the credit? It's, I mean, I think both people should get the credit most of the time. I, it's hard to answer this with one answer because I don't know the relationship between every director and their DP. Sometimes, you know, the DP comes up with a great idea that winds up being some sort of iconic shot or sequence or whatnot. And sometimes the director could come up with the idea. For all I know, the director was the one sitting there storyboarding. So I think it's just a, a case by case kind of thing. Okay. Broca? Yeah, I agree with uh, Perry. I, and also, this is an interactive situation most of the time, or a collaborative situation most of the time, you know, because the DP is there, but the DP also ha hires his crew most mm -hmm. of the time. So he trusts those those people on his crew to have a good eye of what to look for, to light it in a certain way. Of course, the DP is the person, the cinematographer is the person who decides how it's lit, but then you've got to factor in the editor who comes in and cuts the film and keeps certain certain sections longer or se or holds certain shots longer, so all of that. And mm -hmm. the director, of course, obviously oversees it all and approves the final cut most of the time. Or I guess they approve the final cut most of the time, right? Or they look at the final cut at least most of the time, the director's and say, yes, this is the film, this if, is if great. If they have Final Cut approval. Right, yeah. right, I guess. But, uh, so th there's a lot of people that get involved. I'm sure producers get involved as well. And so you there's could a factor in the editor, too. Yeah, maybe, that's what I just maybe said, some. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I editor, wasn't listening to I know, you. I know, I know. My bad. It's, it's, now I feel bad, it's, actually. It's okay, it's okay. It's, it's, a, it's a normal thing it's for part Perry of it, not you know, to listen to well, you. Well, she's yeah. got 40 people. She's got 40 things she's doing at the same time. She's a very popular person, so I respect that. I only focus on two things. And so, like, you know, it's this is all of this is really great. It's a really great question, but you have to factor in that this is a more collaborative effort than you think. And I don't think a lot of directors nowadays take away credit from uh, from DPs and from cinematographers because it's a more recognized art form now. You see that in the old days. Like one of my favorite is is Orson Welles' shot at the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of um, um, A Touch of Evil. Those are one of the most amazing, you know, long takes that you ever mm -hmm. see or the long takes Scorsese does in, in Goodfellas when they go all the way down into the, into that, the restaurant into the from yeah, behind. That's actually my favorite long take uh, Wonder, Wonder of, yeah. of, of all time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I love um, a lot of the long takes with uh, from Birdman, of course. Oh I mean, yeah, that, that mm -hmm. was more Absolutely. modern example. I mean, Gravity, that yeah. opening yeah. shot. Gravity. You know, That's I mean, and there's some tricks they use too sometimes, but I mean, it's just fantastic. I remember, like, uh, who was it? Uh, Michael Keaton would say it's tough because you do those scenes and you mess up. You got to go all yep. the way back to the beginning. Yep. So I remember he said it's tough to do those scenes. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it is a collaboration <laughs> issue, and it, it's it's more like the director has the vision or idea for something. And then the DP is supposed to execute that vision. Sometimes, though, the cinematographer will come up with an idea mm -hmm. and present it to the director, and he approves of it. And then the director can take all the credit for it. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it is one of those issues where it, it's hard to hard to t 
tell who actually gets all the credit. You know, it's and a good uh, long take, old boy. Oh yeah, old boy. Yeah. That just crossed my mind, yeah. and and it follows. It follows is a really good example of doing a uh, one really long take, and it serving the type of scare you're getting, because mm -hmm. like especially the beginning opening scene, it's this it's this crazy shot, and it just kind of does a super slow 360 as you see things happening around the screen, and it it matches what the movie wants you to do, or or what the scare in the movie mm -hmm. wants you to do, which is kind of always be looking over your shoulder if the it is there. And mm -hmm. because of the way that is shot, it makes you start doing that right when the movie starts. And because, you know, again, shameless plug, but it, it, we are starting to see it more in TV now as well. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you saw True Detective Season 1, Episode 8. Yeah. Dennis, I know you know that shot I'm talking about. Incredible uh, one shot right there. Also, too, um, the Nick. Steven Soderbergh mm -hmm. show on Cinemax, which ended sadly too young, but some amazing one shots there. It's a lo long take. Sorry, there. I mean, it's a really incredible job. There's a great classic film called The Russian Ark. If you want to go deep into this, it's a 96 minute take. So go and watch this movie. Oh. It's a classic movie, and you'll see it. It's a 96 minute take, and I. It's something we. <laughs> I, it's on Criterion, and I, I love Criterion stuff, and they they have this film on there, and you can go into and watch this film and see if there's where the cuts are, if there are any cuts, if you can catch them. It's amazing. Yeah, so, I yeah, mean, like that's Bird, a Birdman's insane. supposed to be one long take. There's obviously certain segments where you can tell they 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 stitched it together, yeah. but it's technically, but even then, that's really impressive because they're yes. going for you know, long periods of time. And, and what I do like about the, the oneers or the long take is, is that it, it builds a lot of tension when you watch it because mm -hmm. it's not cutting away. When you watch a movie, every time they cut away, there's kind of a release as an mm -hmm. audience or a viewer. You're like, okay, this is, you know, but like when they just keep that one take, it's you kind of are anticipating something happening and they, the, the, I guess the filmmaker's not letting you yeah. go. Mm -hmm. so. All right, guys, uh, now let's move on to your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Wendy, what do we got first? The first one comes from Daniel, who writes, Thoughts on the recent report that Avatar 2's 2018 release date has been pushed back? Not surprised. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a, it's James Cameron. And because it's James Cameron, he can do that. Mm -hmm. If this is another filmmaker, trust me, that filmmaker, psh, they, mm -hmm. they kick him out. But he's already delivered on two of the biggest movies of all time, and he makes money, so they're going to let him do what he wants. Perry? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. We had not been hearing enough about this movie to suggest that it was actually going to make that date. And at this point, I'm just kind of curious to see an Avatar movie come out and see what happens with it. Because mm -hmm. I know it made a crazy amount of money. It's one of the most profitable movies of all time. But I don't really know all that many people, like, in my casual life, not even mm -hmm. here that talk about movies all day, I don't know many people who talk about Avatar anymore. It was a big yeah. deal when it came out, and I know mm -hmm. some friends who saw it a couple times in theaters, but nobody watches and rewatches it that I know right now. And I, for one, am not all that excited anymore. I mean, it's a lot of years between mm -hmm. movie one and movie two. Okay. Yeah, and the interesting part of this all is Disney is coming. I think they have been seeing the ads on TV for uh, Walt Disney were, uh, coming out with their Avatar Land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pandora, uh, so or whatever. Pandora or whatever. Yeah, so that's going to kind of mm -hmm. uh, put that in there. And I, you know, they, they, I know that they've been having auditions here in LA for people to play the mm -hmm. Navi characters, and so they, they they're definitely in process of creating this world. It's but the delay is not a surprise. If there's anyone who's meticulous to the last detail. It is James Cameron, and so he's going to do it when he's ready to do it because right. the man don't need the money. Mm -hmm. it, it's a matter of like, okay, he's, he's going to be do it when he feels absolutely comfortable and maybe waiting a little bit longer, he can take advantage of even more cutting-edge technology and what have you. So, But I agree with Perry. Like, Not a lot of people will talk about Avatar necessarily. He's like, excited to see the next Avatar, but I think the Walt Disney rolling out that land is a way to kind of re uh, put it back into the mainstream. Well, David, too, some of the... Um Stuff we get when he's away is interesting. I mean, if you're a mm. fan of nature, if you like yeah. shows like Planet Earth, I mean, mm. Cameron, he loves underwater stuff. So he's yeah. in a submarine shooting, you know, Titanic. He did a Titanic documentary a few years back. I mean, they're really yeah. interesting and fascinating pieces. So he's not just sitting around on his couch, you know, uh, no. counting his money. I mean, he's out there doing things, exploring the world. So uh, I like some of the documentaries you get from him when he's not film, uh, doing like a standard film. Mm. All right, let's see. James Thomas Bethia writes, thoughts on the Atomic Blonde trailer? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll let uh, Perry yes. talk about this first because we watched this right before the show started and she uh, had a very big reaction to it. I'm just so excited. If you watch that, that is the most badass thing I've seen in a while. People keep saying it's uh, Charlize Theron's John Wick. Oh, my God. Talk about a good long take, actually. That yeah. opens up with a crazy hand-to-hand -hand combat scene done in one take. And 
I don't really know how they have an A-list actress, you know, tumbling downstairs. I don't know if, if you could fake that or anything, but wow, she looks legit in this. This thing looks just like so much fun. I think it might be screening at uh, at South by Southwest, which is breaking my heart a little that I'm not going to be there. But wow, this thing looks like it could be kind of like the next John Wick mm -hmm. sensation. Oh. Well, yeah, I, I saw that with you. And it's uh, the same director, uh, David Litch, or one mm -hmm. of the, the co-directors of John Wick. So I also like that this was a, a Red Band trailer. Mm -hmm. And so we got to see much more of the violence, the like cussing, uh, there's some sex in there. I knew you so, were going yeah. there. You felt awkward about it, but you did it. <laughs> uh, awkward, maybe. Uh, um, did you guys check this out? Uh, we're checking it out now, and it looks fantastic. It looks cool. It yeah, looks so good. Yeah, it looks great. I mean, uh, oh, this kind of reminds me of the stairwell scene with like Daredevil in yeah. season two. There's a long one, you know, one take well, stairwell scene. And I think this is she's perfect for this kind of part. I mean, like she's Eon Flux was such a colossal mistake, and mm. she's great to play these action type heroes. She's been. Uh, perfectly set up for a while now to play these kinds of parts. And as a little side note, I actually had her in my room uh, last week uh, at Universal Studios as a wand, uh, wand person, and I, I, she was there. I couldn't oh. believe she was there. No she was there way. with the kids. Oh, yeah. that's cool. I thought uh, that was going to be a really awkward story at first, yeah, but then You should have led with the yeah, Universal so Studies I. first. You're like, oh, I had her in my room, room last your room. week. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's terminology. Okay. That's what, terminology what, 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 what fantasy, you know, are you talking about? I apologize. Terminology for the park. What kind of dream did Roka have? And now he's relaying to that is super cool, though. She was great. And there was no VIP thing. She just came in with her kids with the rest of the crowd. Oh, that's awesome. That's, and that's what she's known for at the park. She will come to Universal Studios, hang out, and mill about with everybody. She was hanging out at the wand shop, buying her own wands for her kids. It was great. And nice. I didn't even notice it was her till it was the end of the show, and I saw her walking out with her children. I was like, oh, man, I should have. But that's the kind of person that she is, which is why I'm such a fan of hers. Mm. And I, I always champion her to do these kinds of roles and be in these kinds of parts. And she's she has the right strength and power. We saw that. No, we're not going to say it. We, we saw it. I'll say for you. We saw her in Fury Road what she could do with a part like that. Yeah. So when it's written really well and really plays to her talents, how could you not be excited to see her in this? She's also a big fan of the UFC. Like you'll yeah, always see her in the audience. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's right. David, a tough South Africa. Oh, definitely because of Charlize. You know, like I know we're not doing buy or sell, but I would definitely like buy this just because of her. I mean, she mm -hmm. has that gravitas, man. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> it's the word for it. Yeah, no, she is. She is just so suited for these kind of roles, and she can. She's a chameleon. She can hide. She's one of the most beautiful women. I've ever seen, but yes. yet she can play a movie like Monster or, you know, is it North Country or yeah, North, North, Country. North Country? I mean, she, is, she can blend in, you know, Devil's Advocate. I like Devil's Advocate, yeah, Keanu Reeves yeah. and uh, Al Pacino. That's a good movie. So, I mean, I love Charlie. So I'm definitely down for this. All right, let's do one more. Okay, this one comes from Chase Waldefell, who writes, with so many theaters now incorporating in-theater dining, motion seats, and et cetera, do you think the basic movie theater is dying? I don't think it's dying. I think it's transforming. It needs to transform into a much more pleasant experience. You can't just have a tiny screen with crappy sound with uncomfortable seats anymore because someone can stay at home in, in their comfortable couch, eat their better food. They can watch on their big screen TV with great sound. And so if you can't beat that experience, then no one's going to come and see it. So that's mm -hmm. why I always talk about something like the AMC Prime is such a fantastic experience. I cannot replicate that experience mm -hmm. at home as much as I try, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's dying. I think it's going to transform. I would actually even like it to transform more to like a, a, a regular theater going experience where you do, they already have the, the numbered seating, the signed seating, but like have it be like where you're paying for better seats and mm. then maybe there's cheaper oh. seats that type oh. of thing what, yeah. what do you guys think like a stadium you mean like, yeah, a, yeah, like yeah. a football like going yeah. to see a sports mm -hmm. thing well so. I'm, I'm gonna go see that uh, Game of Thrones music experience oh, yeah. at the end of this month and you know you're paying for where you're sitting yeah. you know depending if you're closer or farther away that's interesting uh, I think the, the standard movie theaters will never go away because they are. They just drop the prices, and they'll they'll convert to lower priced, like you know, the six dollar movies, two dollar movies. We see that here in LA. Mm -hmm. There are a few yeah. theaters like that. That's going to happen because, unfortunately, there is you know there is a lower class that cannot go and pay eighteen dollars per person to take their family to see a film. They will go lower power. Uh, they will go and and see these films for four dollars, three dollars, and it's cheaper for them to go. And most of the times, the popcorn is cheaper, the coke is cheaper, those kinds of things. So I don't think that'll ever die out. The theater going experience will never die out. But 
But I think for those of us that can afford for a higher end, we want to go and have these, like the leather seats mm -hmm. that they have now mm -hmm. at the Universal uh, City Theaters. Mm -hmm. Those are fantastic and a great way to enjoy the film. So if you can afford it, absolutely, because you're right, Dennis, they want to make it as relatable to your own living room as possible. Because you can watch it, you could get a 60-inch or an 80-inch television for a modern amount of money and have a nice couch and pause it when you go to the bathroom, come back, mm -hmm. eat your food, make your food, get out of the kitchen. So you can do all that at home. Why wouldn't you do it? And sound system, the sound bars, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you want to have to be able to do that in a the theater? So yeah. it just makes sense. Uh, also, I you know I bring <laughs> some of my own snacks into the. Do theater. you still do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, sure, I'm sure Perry and Sinead can relate. Oh yeah. Bring donut holes mm -hmm. to, to to the theater <laughs> as well. It's only the best. Yeah. True. Uh, oh, what do you I think, Perry? I don't like the word dying because I I don't think we're ever gonna be mm -hmm. in a time where it is just completely not an option. Right. However, it, there's also no denying the fact that at this point it seems to be trending at home streaming or super high-end experiences that just keep adding more and more features or, or more and more little things that can up a price. It seems like the middle ground is shrinking. I don't think it'll ever go away because I think we could also hit a point where it goes away to such an extent that it becomes a novelty and we'll mm -hmm. wind up with a novelty. Th like, remember back in the early 90s when you right. used to just, like, go and sit in a normal movie theater and pay eight bucks? Like, do that here. I think that might be what we're going to end up with, but... Yeah, it's a it's a an exciting and scary time because like I love the fact that we have all these features and I'm addicted to things like Alamo Draft Houses. Mm -hmm. I like, I want more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you want more of an experience now versus just sitting and watching a movie. Yeah, right. I mean it's just kind of not enough anymore. Yeah, David. Well, like I'm in you know, and around Pasadena there's a theater called IPIC, mm -hmm. and IPIC is oh, even yeah. a step above yeah. what Prime is, and it's like these plush seats. You mm -hmm. get it's like first class on an airplane. You get a blanket, you get a pillow. You have your own server, and you think it would be distracting, but there's only about 40 people in the theater with you, and you press the button like in first class, and she comes up, and she gets you a drink, she gets you food, and it's not distracting at all. You don't notice the servers interacting with other guests. You just focus on the film, which I was really impressed by. So it's expensive. It's about $22 a ticket, not mm -hmm. including drinks and things. So it is pricey. If you're going like, on a nice date, you can kind of combine dinner and a movie at the same time, which is cool, but... At AMC here, I know in Burbank, you can go uh, you can go to a movie on a Saturday or Sunday. The first showing of every Saturday and Sunday is for a regular showing is seven dollars and fifty cents. And that's in LA. That's mm -hmm. a major city, and that's mm -hmm. not bad. So, like Roka said, prices are going down. They are being more reasonable. You just have to kind of look for those bargain deals. Yeah. So I think the movie theater is going to stay around for a while because you can't if you go to an IMAX or a Prime, you can't mint make that in your house unless yeah. you're just like a multi-millionaire and you right. can build some humongous screen. James Cameron. James yeah. Cameron can. Yeah. Sinead, are you bringing your donuts to to the movie <coughs> theaters? Mm -hmm. that, that totally. Cool? I bring donut holes. I, uh, um, but I, to answer this question, but I really do. Um, and also, really quick before I answer this question, I heard today that Voodoo Donuts opened up at yes. CityWalk. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. No one, I had no idea they were even building it. Girl, don't go today. I the, had three. The line's like down the block. Yeah, I know. I, I had heard. three of them yesterday. Three really? of donuts. Yeah, they brought them in they the had Harry a, Potter. They had, room. like, I guess they just, like, soft opened, but yeah. they're. They're gonna open like for real, for real next, next week. week. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! Can we do okay. a field, like a day field trip. We should. To we should. Voodoo Donuts. And that AMC it. over there is like crazy now, right? Because mm -hmm. they revamped that one too. Mm -hmm. is, is it even an AMC anymore? It is. It is. is it still an AMC? It, yeah. um, and it was good before. Like it was yeah. a great theater before. But I, I agree with what Roka was saying. You have to have. Um, movie theaters that people can still afford at a cheaper rate because especially like when I was in Illinois that's all we did like in the suburbs like we went to the movie theaters every single weekend and we were going to the movie theaters before like five so we were paying seven twenty five a ticket um, and we could do that every every weekend so I think that they have to have cheaper tickets because people love to see movies and it would be a shame if every single time you went to the movie you were forced to buy over a over an $18 ticket, which mm. is most theaters in LA. Mm. Um, so I definitely think don't get rid of them, but I like your idea of having like those cheaper theaters at maybe a theater that also has all the bells and whistles and that kind mm. of stuff. Mm. Wendy? Those uh, uh, amenities, like motion seats and stuff like that, those are deluxe items. Yeah. Uh, I can't always afford to go to a movie, pay like $24 a ticket just to get like 4D or, or 4K and and a motion seats, and yeah. Pillow. Like I, I mean, it's nice, Kinda but it's a luxury. <laughs> I can't, I can't afford that. I still, till this day, go to dollar theaters. Yeah, yeah. I do too. Yeah. Actually, mm -hmm. the two dollar theater that's right around the corner yeah. over near Pasadena, and there's one in the Valley too. Those yeah. are great. Like when you want to see a movie that maybe you missed or like you were never excited about seeing, and they just they after like three months after they come out of theaters, all these movies show up. It's two bucks like yeah. to go. It's 
totally like awesome. That's yeah, I don't, I don't want to see the traditional theaters to go away. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was your problem. That's we'll why I saw Pacific Rim because I wasn't that excited about it. for three dollars. <laughs> All right, guys, I want to thank everyone joining us at the table today. Perry, where can people find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemroff. I'm hosting Mailbag this weekend, one with this guy right here and another with Mark Riley. And then, of course, Collider behind the scenes tomorrow, 2 p.m. Watch it. It's fun. Roca. Hey, right, guys, you can, you can always find me at The Roca Says on Twitter and Instagram. And yeah, like Perry said, I will be on Mailbag this weekend. Also, we'll be, we'll, Perry and I and Dennis will be on uh, The Walking Dead Review Show this Sunday night. And of course, uh, we dropped a new episode of The Cinephiles this morning on iTunes and on Stitcher. Uh, we uh, profiled Modern Times. Times, Charlie Chaplin's uh, film that just and leaving the silent film age into the talkies. David, I'm on a little show called Clatter TV Talk with uh, <laughs> the lovely Sinead DeFries over there. If you didn't already know that from all my TV references on the show, I always apologize for that. Uh, I do that every Monday uh, on Clatter TV. Also, I'm on Star Wars Rebels Review. That'll come on Saturday. And I was on Jedi Council uh, with Christian Harloff uh, yesterday. So check that out, too. Wendy? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at that so and I'll be back on Monday hosting TV Talk. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram Dennis.tzng. Don't forget to check out Friday's Movie Talk where I'm at, also the Walking Dead review show. Like I mentioned before, the awesome tacular sketch La La Land in real life is up on our YouTube channel right now that I directed. Check that out. Thanks to Adam and Cody in the back, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.